Support has been provided by an independent educational grant from AbbVie, Amgen, Astellas, AstraZeneca, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genomic Health, Genentech, Merck, Pfizer Incorporated, and Sanofi Genzyme. CME for this podcast is available at AUA University, auau.auanet.org. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to uh, to our course today on shared decision making. Um, uh, this is a, a really exciting uh, course for me to, to do. Uh, this is the first time uh, we're offering this sort of shared decision making course, uh, and we have uh, we're super fortunate to have like like all star celebrity faculty. Uh, uh, we have uh, Angie Fagerlin, who's chair of uh, of uh, population health uh, at University of Utah, and uh, she's an expert in uh, shared decision making around prostate cancer treatment. And uh, we have the legendary Michael Berry uh, from from MGH and, and Harvard, um, who uh, uh, <laughs> so for uh, for PSA uh, uh, screening. Um, so uh, very excited to have you guys here, uh, and, and it's uh, it's turning out to be a, a nice uh, nice turnout. Uh, just to give you guys some idea of what this is going to look like, we this is broken up into three sort of parts. Uh, Dr. Fagerlin will begin with uh, with a 30 minute sort of description of of what shared decision making is and, and, and the state of the science. Uh, then uh, Dr. Barry and I will lead two 45-minute sessions uh, that include some didactics around uh, first uh, uh, the screening decision, uh, and then we will and, and then I will do treatment. Uh, and after we have a, a short sort of description of, of the of the question, we'll break into uh, small groups of four, and we'll do some hands-on uh, role play, uh, and uh, that's what. Uh, that's what there's some there's some shared uh, there's some decision aids floating around in the audience. If you guys don't have one, maybe we can share when when the time comes. Uh, it's also available online, like through the app. If you click on the slides, it has the two shared it has the two decision aids that, that we're going to be doing. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Fagelin. So I'm going to try to give you a background of shared decision making and some kind of helpful tools to help um, improve the shared decision making process. Um, here are my disclosures, which are very little. So let me begin by first defining patient engagement. So this is what we talk about a lot, is the importance of engaging patients into the decision-making process. And so here is an example, here is a, a nice definition. Patient and family engagement is defined as patients, families, their representatives, so f caregivers, family, loved ones, and health professionals working in an active partnership at various levels across the healthcare system direct care, organizational design and governments, and policy, maker, policy making to improve health and health care. And one way to do that is in terms of what we call shared decision making. And very likely you know what this is, but let me give you the definition and how it's been commonly defined. The idea behind shared decision making is that there's at least two partners in the decision making process, right? There is the clinician, and then there is a patient or, and or the fam and family members. Each of those people in this dyad have a, rela a responsibility. Physicians are responsible for providing information to explain to them their diagnosis, their treatment options, the risks and benefits of those options, and to talk with them about the medical um, implications of their diagnosis and their treatments. On the other hand, patients often have a responsibility to be part of this dialogue and in discussing their values, their goals, their preferences for care. Are they people who are minimizers and don't want to have a lot of treatment and want to avoid it as much as, as possible? Or are they maximizers who are very, the, look towards interventions at a relatively quick period? All of these different issues, the patient knows those and needs to communicate to the providers so that the two of them can work together to figure out the best treatment for that individual patient. And as you can imagine, and I know you probably all have encountered this, this is really challenging. This is not an easy thing to do. And there are challenges on the patient side and there's challenges on the physician side. So in terms of the patient, the challenges include knowledge, 
right? So you're getting a new, di new diagnosis. You may never have heard about this diagnosis, or you may some of your friends might have it, but you don't understand what where the prostate is, what it does, what is the implications of this disease. Um, there's a lot of jargon, if radical prostatectomy, brachytherapy, words that people might never have heard of before you're telling them their diagnosis and their treatment options. Um, and this is especially compounded by people who are, have low literacy and numeracy skills or who speak English as a second language. And so their ability to understand and use this information can be harmed, which makes it difficult for them to really participate in the patient, especially if the first time they're hearing these words or at the time that they're almost expected to make a decision about what treatment course to proceed to. And another part is we talk a lot about bringing people's values into the decision-making process, but people aren't born with values regarding whether they want to get screened for prostate or to what, what treatment that they would want for prostate cancer screening. And so what that requires is for people to understand and, and explore those values. And so within this field, we have what are called values clarification methods, which helps people think about how important certain components of the decision is to them, because not everything matters a lot to a lot of people, for different people. And so that helps them really think about what is important in terms of um, the outcomes. The decision-making process is really difficult. Um, we don't know what else is going on in their lives. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I'm a cognitive psychologist, and so we talk a lot about heuristics and biases, a la Danny Kahneman and Emma Stavursky, where that really helps, that can complicate the decision-making process. And, and, and finally, it's hard to talk to your doctor in many cases, and especially under when you're in stress. Um, I just completed a study looking at wh wh where pa patients lie to their providers and why they do lie, or I guess the proper word is just not disclose information, um, but basically lie. And the, the one of the reasons that they said that it was the biggest reason that they are not disclosing information to their providers that you all would want is because they want you to look good. They want to look good to you. They want you to respect you. They don't want you to think that they're literally that they don't want you to think that they're stupid. They want to present well so they get good care. And so that all those things and all those concerns makes it difficult for many patients to participate in the shared decision making process. And it can also be difficult on the clinician level to share in this and to do in this process. Part of it is time, especially when you're talking about PSA screening, that, that just writing the, the order to get them screened takes significantly less time than having a discussion with them about the pros and cons of getting screening. And we know that physicians are getting more and more um, squeezed for time and how many patients that they're expected to see. There is also people who no, don't necessarily value shared decision making. When I've tried to do some research um, in, in, in private practice, people have told me that they, they think that the patient should get surgery and so they don't want to do shared decision making with them. And so you have to be on the bus to um, want to do this. And then finally, it's really hard to do shared decision making. This is not an easy thing and it's not what a lot of schools are teaching in med school right now. Um, and so and it's, it's a completely different skill set than what a lot of people have been trained to, and so it can be difficult, and that can be another challenge that gets into the way of, of good shared decision making. But even with all those challenges, and, and, and it's the, probably the right thing to do, not probably, it is the right thing to do. Um, and a lot of people agree, including the um, Institute of Medicine um, and the AUA who have both been advocating for this throughout in terms of guidelines um, and, and just policy is the importance of doing shared decision making and especially in domains where, um, especially in domains of, of prostate cancer. Oh, sorry, there was cool animation there. So where, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of discussion about where is shared decision making most important. And there's one camp of people who will say my body, my decision and believe that every single medical decision should be a shared decision between patients and providers. On the other hand, other people say, yes, that's true, but that would take a significant amount of time and we're not going to feasibly be able to share in every decision. So we need to pick the decisions, especially where there is equipoise, where medical professionals agree that there are multiple options that are equally effective and, and valuable to the patient. 
Um, and we call this preference sensitive because really the best decision for any given patient where the medical treatments have clinical equipoise is the treatment that best reflects their values and their goals of, of treatment and that are tailored around to what is important to them. So, but what do we, when we talk about wanting to achieve a high quality preference sensitive decision, what does that actually mean? And what that means is that the patient has a high level of decision specific knowledge. So really when we're talking about pre high, uh, a good preference sensitive decision, we're talking about two components. One is knowledge and understanding, and one is that their values are being reflected in the decision that they make. Um, so in terms of we give, you know, whether they know what the risks and benefits of the treatment are where, and what the implications of those treatment decisions are is one way of measuring knowledge. And then the other is looking at the patient values about that assorted outcome. So an example of a high quality preference decision is that um, a man diagnosed with early stage prostate cancer has a strong preference for decreasing the likelihood of erectile dysfunction and chooses active surveillance. Um, another example is, again, a, a gentleman diagnosed with early stage prostate cancer who the idea of living with a, a growing cancer in his body is very discomforting to him and he does not want to have to think through that and to worry about it, and he would choose radical prostatectomy. So those are two examples of what we would consider a high quality decision, assuming that they have adequate knowledge, as we discussed earlier. So are we there yet? Um, so I do a lot of work also in, in cardiology, and this is a cardiologist that was at a convention talking about um, shared decision making, and he said, isn't shared decision making just being a doctor? Um, and, and my colleague replied, well, yes, it is, but it doesn't mean it's being uniformly implemented well. And in fact, we know that in many cases, it's not. Most people don't feel comfortable disagreeing with a physician's recommendations. They're perfectly happy to ask questions, discuss their preferences, but if they disagree with their physician's recommendation, they're very unlikely to disagree. And to put this in context, this study was done in Palo Alto with a very, very highly educated, wealthy sample. So the people that you would think would be the most empowered to disagree with their physicians were not able to do that and did not feel comfortable in doing that. And this is of concern because in many cases, in visits where people are talking about, for example, cancer treatment options, a recommendation comes pretty early on in the conversation. And if that happens, it will be very difficult for the patient to discuss why that, that choice might not be good or to disagree. And they might end up going on a path that they were not entirely in favor of. And one of the reasons they fear be, um, they do not want to disagree with their provider is they fear being labeled a difficult patient. Um, I look around, I think a lot of you probably watched Seinfeld in the day, um, and there was a great episode where Elaine had been um, labeled a, a um, difficult patient in her medical records, and people would come in and say, well, hello, Elaine. Oh, I mean, hi, okay. And then they would get really serious, and all the warmth would go out of the room, and the conversations became much shorter. And so I think that is a, it, though it's Seinfeld, and it's, it's funny because it's Seinfeld, it's also a true thing that people do worry about. And this was from a focus group, and I thought this was a great quote. I do not regard my doctor as my savior. What I want them to be is my native guide through this jungle of decisions and a full partner in executing that decision. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we do this shared decision making? How can we make this easier both on the patient and the providers? Well, one way is through what are called decision aids. And decision aids um, are, there can be booklets or websites or what have you that explain complex medical decisions to patients in, um, in a way that they can understand. And we know that describing all this information to patients in a short visit can be very difficult. Um, it's hard to have the time to really engage with this. And so there's advantages of having people get this information before they come and talk with you so they know what a radical prostatectomy is, so they know what brachytherapy is, so they understand what a Gleason score is. We've talked with a lot of men, and most of them do not understand Gleason scores and how that has any impact on their health care. So what these decision aids do is explain those in ways, usually pretty low literacy ways, so that people can understand and absorb this information so they can come to the clinical visit more prepared. Um, so the, these, dis, these interventions explain what the problem is, 
detailed information about the treatment options, the risks and benefits of those options, and it's a written record of this information because we know that even if you had an hour with your patient and you could explain everything perfectly, if we could use you as a video of the best explainer in the world, they're going to remember about 25 or 30 percent of what you heard because it's just so much information. So this is a written rec record of that information, which is, can be beneficial. And uh, decision aids also help them think through their values and goals of care. And then it often has information like, what are your top five questions you want to ask your provider? What is the most important things that you you want your provider to know when during your visit so that they don't start asking their questions and saying these things as your hand is on the door and you're trying you're walking out and they remember their three questions by having that organized it allows them to, in the, the process to go much smoother so as I said earlier there's many different decision aids one of the left one will um, you guys have um, both printed and on the um, on the app. Um, so there's booklets, there's websites, and there's apps. There's even an app for that, for prostate cancer treatment. Uh, decision aids can be used at multiple different times. One, what I described before, is before they see the visit, so they've maybe gotten their diagnosis and they haven't had a chance to talk with you about the treatment options yet. So they can do that. There's also decisions um, typically called encounter decision aids or clinical decision support, where it's really a tool for the clinician to help guide them through this discussion, how to explain things in really simple languages, some questions to get at in terms of their values and goals. And then decision aids can be used, especially the ones developed for the pre-visit, can also be very valuable after the visit for people to revisit and consider. The goals of decision aids are to improve informed decision making by describing the disease, the available treatments, and the risks and benefits, and to help people clarify their values. It will also um, help uh, increase the concordance between values and treatments, um, increase the goal is to increase patients' partic participation in decision making, and increase informed decision making so that people really understand um, what these risks and benefits are and how that could affect their lives. When we've done focus groups in the past, we had people say, my doctor did a great, great job talking and explaining to me about the likelihood of erectile dysfunction or incontinence, but I didn't understand what it would feel like to live with erectile dysfunction in, in, in um, incontinence, how that would actually feel. So it really tries to help increase that understanding and knowledge. Um, in one of the, the most widely cited Cochrane reviews out there um, has reviewed, and this Cochrane review has reviewed um, over 110 studies. It's updated every two years, looking at the impact of decision aids and what it actually does. Um, so far, there's been 105 trials in this current version with over 31,000 participants. And what they have found is that decision aids increase patient knowledge, patients' involvement in the decision, the proportion of patients with accurate risk perceptions, and the consistency between patients' decisions and what they reported as their most important values. They also decrease um, people feeling uninformed or unclear about their personal values, not knowing what is important to them, so it decreases that feeling of un being uninformed. It decreases the proportion of patients who remain undecided and kind of paralyzed by the decision making. And it's also been found to show to decrease elective surgeries or other kind of elective tests. Okay. So the other thing we want to talk about is kind of some tricks um, to help improve the patient-provider communication. And there's a couple things that can be very helpful in terms of people's understanding of the risks and benefits. One of the, the, the best examples is the use of absolute versus relative risk information. A lot of what we get in journal articles or from other places give information in terms of relative risk. And so people will get really jazzed if you tell them that a drug or a treatment could reduce your risk by 50% per se. Um, how many people would be interested in that? That sounds pretty good, right? Um, but if you tell them that it decreases their risk from 2% to 1%, yes, a 50% risk reduction, eh, it's a little less exciting, you know, to have to take a medicine every day or to have a, a major treatment. Um, and so what we like to say is absolutely best to use absolute risk presentation because it really helps people put the information into context and understand really what the benefit they'll be receiving is. 
Communicating risks and benefits. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever said back in the day when we used to do this, I can't balance my checkbook or I'm not a numbers kind of person. You hear that, I'm not a math person. You hear this a lot from patients. Presenting numbers and giving numbers can be really difficult, um, but there's, there's things such as the icon arrays or pictographs that is a good way of presenting information really quickly to people to kind of put into context what that number means, how many people are actually affected. And that link right there, it, you can literally make one of these in about five seconds. It's a really easy um, site that we developed. And then simplifying the message. One of the things we tend to do, a lot of people who go into medicine or healthcare, we like a lot of information. We're information seekers. Um, but sometimes we give so much information just because we want to be complete and thorough, but it could actually um, be detrimental. As I'm not a urologist, I do, I do work in a lot of different areas, and so this is an example of work we've done in breast cancer, um, where this is a person who's got early stage breast cancer, they're trying to decide between um, earlier stage, they're trying to decide about whether to have chemotherapy or adjuvant therapy. And so here are all the risks and benefits and, and the survival rates for those four treatment options. But as you might know, um, for many women, there's only two treatment. If you have ER positive, really the choice is you, whether or not you, have, you add chemo to the hormone therapy. If you're ER negative, there's no benefit of doing hormone therapy, so there's no, the only decision is whether you're going to do chemotherapy or not. And so what we've shown that do, we hypothesize is including less information can be helpful. And so what we showed is we just did, this is just silly, right? So we had one where there's four bars and one is two bars. Nothing else has changed, right? But it just means that people only had to process two things, and so they knew what are the two most important decisions. And what we found is a huge difference. About almost 15% of people were better able to answer these questions if th there was only two bars, because it's just helped them to kind of focus in on what was the most important details. So I don't know if you guys have ever gotten this question, but what, what would you do if if, if I was your dad, what would you recommend, right? It's a question that, that clinicians get asked often. Um, and sometimes I've, I've heard some of my colleagues have said, well, you know, I've known my dad for 50 years, so I know what his goals are and his values are and how he does with medicines. So I can give him a really good feel for that, and I can give him a recommendation. But I don't know about that about you because I just met you. So I'm going to ask you some questions to understand what those goals and those values are, and then I can make a better recommendation than just giving my blanket recommendation that I give for any guy who comes in the, in the room. And so I wanted to give you a couple of examples of some of these kinds of questions that you could use. So in terms of when you're trying to talk to somebody about prostate screening, you could ask, or prostate cancer, how much would you worry about prostate cancer if you didn't get screened? How would you feel if you didn't get screened and then found out later that you had advanced prostate cancer? How would you feel if you had treatment for early stage cancer and it ended up with side effects like erectile dysfunction and incontinence? In terms of prostate cancer treatment, other questions are, how often are you having sex? That's a fun one, right? Um, how much impact would it have on you if you were no longer able to have sex? Because if they're not sexually active and they don't plan to be, that might have a different impact in their worries about erectile dysfunction. How would you feel if you didn't have any treatment and you knew you had cancer in your body? How much would you worry? How, how well would you be able to get yourself to the hospital or to your physician's office to get yourself tested every six months? Do you have a job that allows you to do that? Um, what is your biggest worry about your cancer and possible treatments? What is your goal for care? What do you see as the pros and cons of treatment? And by understanding and asking these questions and listening to their answers, it would improve your ability to give a recommendation that would fit that individual patient. And that is my section, but I wanted to give, um, we stopped a little early on this just to make sure that people could ask questions or, or give some comments. So does anybody have questions or comments? I'm so brilliant. It was so clear there's no questions. <laughs> Maybe to, to stimulate discussion. Uh, <laughs> so one of the hardest things, I think, in... Would you come up to the, to the microphone? Because they're recording. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Tom Rusvanis from outside of Pittsburgh. And one, one of the problems I see with this, and, and not problems, one of the challenges um, with this for, for us as a busy practitioner is uh, you have this conversation and every as physicians we almost always have in our mind 
what we really think the pa and not just prostate cancer, but you know, s there are sometimes prostate cancer is a little harder because it's it's hard to nail down, but you know what you think the patient should have done, and you make your recommendation because that's kind of what you're getting paid for to some degree is to finally make some sort of recommendation or at least let them know what you think the best treatment is. And when they decide not to do that, always in the back of my mind, it's that old, but if you really understood the situation, <laughs> you wouldn't make the decision you're making. And, and you always worry about, and, and I know you're not supposed to practice medicine this way, but you always work, worry about somebody coming back two years later and saying, well, if you'd have been more clear with your description, I would have chosen to do what you said to do. Um, but I don't have time to take somebody to medical school in the, you know, half hour to 45 minutes that I'm talking to them. I mean, I realize it's a process, but I don't know, those are just some of my jumbled thoughts about this. And so when somebody, I, I guess it, it gives me a little bit of pause when somebody says, I don't want to do what you're recommending, I'm never sure exactly how much pushback to give them. I want to respect their autonomy, but by the same token, I don't, I don't want to say, if somebody says, I know I have uh, really bad bladder cancer, I don't want any treatment, I don't want to just say, okay, that's, it's your choice, it's your body. I mean, I, I know what happens when they don't get treatment, and it's not, it's not pretty, <laughs> so. Right, and, and... I'm sorry. No, it, I mean, it, believe me, you are not the first person to have said that, and, and actually, um, it, 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 so one of the reasons that we, we set up this whole thing about preference-sensitive decisions at the beginning is, on one hand, there are some decisions, and, and I think prostate cancer treatment, in many cases, not all, obviously, you know, when you get higher up, is really there isn't necessarily one treatment that's going to keep people alive longer, right? And so in that case, it really is up to them. And in, in the cases where it's not preference sensitive, then that's the question of how much, how relevant is your decision making to that conversation, right? I mean, in the end, the patient, you can tell them what to do, right? So you can tell them you need to have surgery for your bladder cancer or, you know, chemo or whatever the, the treatment is psychologist, um, so I don't know that answer. But in the end, you can give a very, very strong recommendation, explain everything perfectly, and in the end, they're the ones who have to make the appointment to go to surgery. They have to show up on surgery day. And so and there is some evidence out there that the more involved patients feel in the decision-making process, the more likely they are to adhere to whatever treatment plan was developed. You know, it's just kind of like how when people, somebody tells you you need to exercise more, you don't, but then when you kind of like fail a commitment, you exercise more, right? And so the advantages of shared decision making, even on difficult, where there seems to be one superior option, is you're more likely to have the person follow that recommendation and adhere to that. Uh, and can I make, uh, this, yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and the other, the other point that you brought up was the time that it takes to go through all of this. So the goal of this course uh, is to maybe give you some tips and tricks to streamline that and simplify that. For instance, if you could have them you know, go through the decision aid before they come to the office visit, then maybe you don't have to spend a lot of time going through like the, the very nuts and bolts of what is PSA or what is prostate cancer, and you can get right to the heart of the uh, values clarification and, and then discussion of the, uh, of the thing. So that, that, that's sort of the hope of this, to, to, to streamline that, that process, that workflow perhaps. Do you, do you ever have like a quick screen for people have, who have different learning styles? You know, some people are more visual learners versus um, auditory versus praxis orientated people, for example. We we haven't what we've tried to do when I've I've developed tools in a, a multiple areas is to kind of have a little bit of all of that. So we have the pictograph for the visual learners, but next to it are the the words of the numbers for people who are, are you know learn better that way. We sometimes have you know when we do um, videos like on websites when they're not booklets, we'll do we'll do the video, but then we'll also have a transcription so that if people don't can't get internet well like where my where my dad lives or if they can't hear or see you know that they could just read um, and so so we've tried to do that it's, it's just in terms of cost to, to, to develop different tools for example for those three different so we just try to combine them into one thing and and the impact of having a, a caregiver or a, a significant other sitting next to you is that significantly different than someone going alone for example 
So there's advantages, I think. And Katrina Armstrong, who's now at Harvard, has done some work on this. And I'm forgetting her results because it's been over a decade of, of the role of partners. But she's a good person to look. One of the things that can be nice about partners is it's two people to remember things instead of one. Somebody who can also take notes. Um, there's this movement a little bit and it came coming out of UCSF of health coaches. Which is, which is not a family member, right? It's, it's somebody who can be a good scribe and who can help ask questions if the person gets too scared to ask questions, if they're worried about timing and stuff like that. And that can actually be beneficial because then there is an accurate representation of what happened in that visit. But I think having that second part, party there can help and answer. They might ask different questions. What, from what I understand, wives ask different questions often than husbands, for example. So they could ask... Um, additional questions as well. Angie, could I just add one thing? Yeah, of course. I'll have to figure out how to turn it. No, it's on. Okay. It's on. You just have um, to talk. A key part, as Angie highlighted, with shared decision making it, 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 for us as clinicians is really trying to learn the patient's values as opposed to just assuming they're like ours and, and bring those to the decision. A risk sometimes with a partner is they may just want to use their values <laughs> rather than they patients' values. One of the advantages of the UCSF program is they train the coaches to, to elicit those preferences. And I find that when I bring partners in, I'll usually make a little speech about, let's, let's focus on making sure your spouse's values are, are what we're bringing to the decision, whether that's end-of-life care or PSA screening. Please. One of the best summaries of a complicated set of toolkits that I've ever heard, so congratulations. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I'm a urologist by training, but I increasingly are kind of focused on the efficiency of primary care delivery models. And uh, as scientists, we're trained to take a reduction as pros, so today we're going to talk about prostate cancer. Tomorrow we're going to talk about this thing. But in the 15 to 20 minutes that you have for, let's say, an annual primary care visit, Okay. How do you use decision age pre-visit in your own thinking to address screening for colorectal, patients a smoker, lung cancer, PSA screening, cholesterol, BMI of 32? Yeah. So I'm actually, I, I don't like to defer, but I'm going to defer to, to Dan because he is, um, is the PI on a study looking at how to get these tools to patients before their clinical visit in terms of PSA screening. So I think that's a great. It's, it's an incredibly important <laughs> question. Uh, we don't have the best answer for it. Um, I, I think you have to figure out what works in the clinic. And, and just this whole issue of prioritizing primary care things, it's, it's not possible to address all the things that you addressed, which are life prolonging uh, interventions uh, uh, or, or issues that need to be challenged, need to be addressed. But um, the, the, way, the thing that we're doing with this trial that we're testing is we're trying to include community health workers to, to function as health coaches. So, uh, and it requires significant coordination, at least at the moment up front as we're, we're getting it started. But there would be somebody who would contact the patient before the visit. Uh, uh, get them a decision aid in their home so that they could look at it, either send them a link or mail them a decision aid and, and ask them to look through it. As part of the trial, we're having, we're having the, the decision coach then go through it with them before they come into the office. But it's, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, Dr. Perry, if you have uh, uh, thoughts on that. Just add a primary care perspective. Um, and it, again, the challenge of primary care is nothing's off limits. We, we can't silo to a limited set of problems. So uh, I think you're raising a key point that, um, and to the extent that many of these important conversations are predictable. Uh, someone turns 50, welcome to the over 50 club, uh, time to talk about colorectal cancer screening. And, and our uh, electronic medical record systems know that event is coming up, know when the first visit is coming uh, after age 50, and can uh, send out material to patients. So we've got a system at, at, at Partners in Boston that's still clunky, but I think is the way of the future where we can prescribe out decision support prior to a visit. And equally importantly, the patient can respond to that decision support and it comes back into the electronic medical record, just like a diagnostic test would. It might be knowledge, questions, preferences. And I think that may be uh, one strategy. 
And with that, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Barry. Let's see. Let me figure out the buttons here. Is this the big gre oh, the green, green one? one. Oh. Okay. It's camouflage. Uh, so Mike Berry, again, um, thank you for coming. And I want to drill down a bit on uh, shared decision making for PSA screening. And um, it, it's an area that's received a lot of attention around shared decision making. And I'll review that a bit. So I uh, work at uh, Mass General Hospital in Boston. Uh, I'm director of the Inform Medical Decisions program there. And uh, what we're about is trying to inform and amplify the patient's voice in healthcare decisions, which involves on the left panel both helping patients to speak up uh, so their voice is a little bit louder in healthcare, but equally importantly in the right panel to increase the acuity of the healthcare system for listening to the patient's voice. Because let's face it, nothing could be worse than having an informed patient who wants to be involved but goes into a hospital or clinician's office and hits a brick wall. I get some grant support uh, from HealthWise, which is a non profit that does make decision aids, although we're not going to talk about those decision aids today. And I'm a primary care doc at Mass General Hospital and professor of medicine at Harvard, both of which are reputed to be nonprofit. <laughs> uh, and a disclaimer, so I'm a member of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, um, but what I'm presenting today are my own views and don't represent the recommendations of the task force, except where I'll note on some individual slides. Uh, and the overall pr uh, presentation should not be attributed to the task force. I'm actually recused from the task force discussions on PSA, so I weren't part of um, uh, the recent decision to change the task force recommendation, and we can talk about if that, that if there's uh, some time, I'll come back to it. I was also on the uh, AUA's uh, prostate cancer screening uh, uh, guideline panel and the American College of Physicians as well. So let's start, and we'll come back to a clinical case. A 56-year-old man is referred to a urologist for an enlarging, bothersome hydrocele. Has no other risk factors for prostate cancer, but being 56 and male is, is enough. The urologist asks if he's discussed PSA screening with his primary care physician, and the patient doesn't remember any such discussion. An interesting question, which I'll come back to you uh, with later, is would you wait in and have that conversation? Would you feel if you were referred that patient specifically for the hydrocel question, whether that is off limits? And my guess is there'll be different feelings about it. Um, so a bit about the PSA screening guidelines. So the American Cancer Society says offer prostate cancer screening at 50, maybe 45 with risk factors, or even 40 for very high risk, basically both African American and a family history. If there's greater than about a 10-year life expectancy, that can be a little hard to predict, but with average comorbidity, it's somewhere around age 75. The American College of Physicians uh, recommends discussing benefits and harms of screening for men aged 50 to 69. The uh, AUA recommends shared decision making for men aged 55 to 69, considering PSA screening, 55 to 69 being the core group in the um, uh, European randomized trial of prostate cancer screening, which was the one trial, as we'll see, that showed a benefit. And the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recently changed its recommendation to a C recommendation, fundamentally a shared decision-making recommendation for age 55 to 69, albeit maintaining the D recommendation uh, against PSA screening for men age 70 and older, although with caveats about you know, overall health and not, um, not specifically age. Um, I, I should say, so in, in many ways, I think the guidelines which were um, uh, uh, 
kind of singing from different song sheets for a while are really coming into alignment around this shared decision-making question, which is why we want to specifically talk about, well, if that's the right thing to do, how do you do it? I should say there's one caveat. The American Academy of Family Physicians, which do a lot of the primary care in the country and a lot of the PSA discussions, who had endorsed the D recommendation from the task force previously, were relatively cool to the revision to the C recommendation. They agree with the shared decision making, but wanted to say in their guideline that in fact, they thought for most men, the, the harms outweighed the benefits. You're gonna see as we uh, talk about this, that this issue of the weighing the harms and benefits is very much in the eye of the beholder, whether it's a clinician or a patient. So uh, again, just to drill down on the uh, AUA recommendation and to read it specifically, from men age 55 to 69, the panel recognized that the decision to undergo PSA screening involves weighing the benefits of reducing the rate of metastatic prostate cancer and prevention of prostate cancer death against the known harm harms associated with screening and treatment. For this reason, the panel strongly recommends shared decision making for men age 55 to 69 that are considering PSA screening and proceeding based on a man's values and preferences, very much aligning with what Angie was telling us about, and uh, was considered a standard, um, uh, something that should be routinely done with an evidence strength grade of B. Now, I can't resist, particularly because uh, uh, my old colleague John McConnell is in the audience, I'll point out that the AUA has actually been a real leader in folding the concept of shared decision making into its guidelines and into the routine practice of medicine. Going back to the first uh, AUA uh, guideline on BPH treatment, John was the head of that panel and, uh, um, and focused on um, having discussions with, with men about the severity of their symptoms, how much it bothered them, and the treatments that were available, and folding their preferences into the BPH treatment decision. So the AUA was really recommending shared decision making in the setting of BPH before it was fashionable as well, real leaders in that regard. So in some ways, oh, <laughs> Philip Dahm, University of Minnesota, or Minneapolis VA. One could argue, though, that it really does not provide a recommendation. Right? Saying you should use shared decision-making provides relatively little guidance, I, I would argue. Um, so let's, let's come back to that when we talk about how to operationalize it, because this is all a work in progress. So how do we make it real is the question. So in some ways, one of the... Um, one of the forces that brought us to shared decision making was the recommendation of geographic practice variation, that where people live and who they consult sometimes drive the care they get more than what they care about and what their clinical condition is. So this is some data, uh, a bit dated now, but it was the most recent from the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare. And this is looking at Medicare beneficiaries, basically 66 to 75. Um, and again, these are folks who would generally have, with average comorbidity, uh, at least a 10-year life expectancy. And these plots uh, are the way the Dartmouth Atlas shows variation by geographic area. So if you look down at the bottom of the distribution, it turns out if you live in northern New Hampshire at this time, uh, your chance of having had a PSA test in the last year was about 4%. But if you lived in Miami, your chance of a PSA test in the last year was about 58%. This kind of practice variation, and I'm just presenting PSA, you can see it over and over again for these preference-sensitive conditions where there's more than one reasonable thing to do, almost begs the imagination. How could it be that great? What are the forces that drive it? And of course, underlying that, and I'll come back to this, what's the right rate um, for, for some of these, uh, again, preference sensitive conditions? One theory is that forces sustaining that unwanted practice variation 
are on the patient's side, patients making the decision in the face of what I call avoidable ignorance. That they just don't know the facts, they often don't know what they don't know, and uh, but those are knowable facts that we could impart to them, and that's part of what the shared decision-making uh, effort is about. And then, as clinicians, sometimes being less than optimal in what I'll call the diagnosis of patient preferences, and I find myself falling into this trap as a clinician of sort of assuming that patients think as I do in terms of values, that things that sound reasonable or even optimal to me may not, based on their values, be the right thing for them. And that seems to be an important driver of what I'll call poor decision quality, and I'll come back to how we might measure that, sustaining this unwanted practice variation, and whether getting informed patients involved can help us get to the right rate is an interesting question now in shared decision-making. Decision so, a little more about um, urology, which again I would argue has uh, led the way in many ways. We've done um, uh, national surveys of people who've had different procedures, and um, we have measured in some of those studies four aspects of what I'll call decision quality. Did the doctor, and these are questions for the patient who's been through a procedure, did the doctor discuss the reasons for the procedure? That's usually pretty high for most decisions. Did the doctor discuss the reasons you might not want the procedure? That tends to be lower. Did the doctors discuss any alternatives as a serious option? And it, it turns out asking the question that way, serious option, um, you know, again, active surveillance, yeah, but you wouldn't want that. Um, and that may be true in some cases, but not in others. Uh, so asking whether uh, other things were discussed. And did the doctor ask about your preference for treatment? And that's a core of what I'll call decision quality questions that's now approved by the National Quality Forum as a shared decision-making quality measure. And I'm just going to contrast two procedures, um, radical prostatectomy surgery for prostate cancer and uh, another procedure done by my colleagues in internal medicine and cardiology, coronary stenting. And what you can see is, in general, discussions about radical prostatectomy, and these were, again, patient perspectives, nationwide random sample of everyone in the country who had a radical prostatectomy paid for by Medicare, 95% um, in, in, uh, for radical prostatectomy discussed reasons for, 63% discussed reasons you might not want to do it, room for improvement, but still pretty good, discussed other options as a serious option, presumably radiotherapy and uh, active surveillance if the criteria were right, 64%. And the doctor asked about the patient preferences. What, what, what do you think you'd want to do? 75%. Again, these from the patient's perspective, not just the clinician's perspective. And look how that contrasts with the proportion for coronary stenting. Most people who have coronary stenting, when asked why they did it, will say, well, I was trying to prevent a heart attack or live longer. That's not what the research shows that procedure is about. So again, another example, like the BPH example, where I think urology in some ways has led the way in this area, although, again, room to improve for all of us. So, um, as Angie said, you can do shared decision making with decision aid, without decision aids, but it's a lot more efficient with decision aids. And um, if you go to the auto A to Z inventory <coughs> of patient decision aids, you can find decision aids for pretty much any health problem. This is a list of decision aids for the PSA uh, discussion. Um, you have to uh, turn your decision aid in, and it gets rated by uh, this website. And in fact, we're going to be using a decision aid today from the American Cancer Society that, that's not even listed. So these decision aids are available out there, and this would be a resource to find them, and I've included the URL. Just a word about the screening trials, um, and I'll, I'll be a little bit controversial here, but kind of back off on the language, uh, because I think this group is pretty familiar with them. We basically have three now, the PLCO trial uh, in the United States, the RSPC trial from Europe, and then the, the CAP trial from the UK, the, the newest uh, entry into the block. And I've given you the intervention 
The effect on prostate cancer incidence per thousand men screened for 10 years. And I've used the phrase uh, men getting, uh, uh, for example, for PSL, PLCO, about 12 more men get prostate cancer. You may think it's unfair to say, gee, is Barry saying PSA testing causes prostate cancer? Well, of course not, biologically. But to the extent that if you get a PSA test, you're more likely to face the diagnosis of prostate cancer. And the trials all show that. So uh, for PLCO, about 12 more men out of 1,000 over 10 years get a diagnosis of prostate cancer. In ERSPC, which showed a difference in terms of mortality, um, fit about 57 more men get prostate cancer. And in the CAP trial, it was about 19 more men. And I do worry that um, patients often come to this decision thinking, gosh, screening is going to reduce my risk of getting cancer. We're actually for prostate cancer and most other solid cancers we screen for. It's going to increase the incidence. Hopefully, we'll see decreased mortality. And in fact, in the RSPC, at 10 years, uh, one fewer man died of prostate cancer on that database based on 10 years. We now have brand new 16-year data that suggest at 16 years, uh, it's about uh, 30 more men get prostate cancer in the screen versus the control group after, 15, uh, after uh, 16 years of follow-up. But the one fewer man becomes 1.8 fewer men almost two. So uh, again, that's a change over time. How big a change, again, in the eye of the beholder. So what are the things we may want to include in a PSA discussion? We're going to be going through the ACS decision aid, which will have this information. Um, but I've listed some potential things here uh, that uh, are included in most decision aids. The issue of um, if you get a PSA test, it's going to increase your risk of facing a diagnosis of cancer is probably the key part I would emphasize. Uh, but again, we'll go through that. Um, what do men do when you routinely use a decision aid? This is a study we did with about 1,000 men in New England uh, in different primary care practices where having a PSA test, uh, the, the options were having a PSA test, not being sure, or not having a PSA test. And what you see here is the, the dark green was before the light green was after seeing the decision aid. And fundamentally, what's happening here is that the men who are not sure to start with tend to get off the fence in the direction of not being tested. It works differently for other conditions. In um, hip replacement surgery, the unsure people tend to get off the fence in favor of treatment. But still, about a third of well-informed men uh, want to be PSA tested. That, to me, sounds like a preference-sensitive condition. Um, I'll just mention shared decision-making is busting out all over. Here's an article in Science, shared decision-making drives collective movement in wild baboons. Turns out that they don't just follow the alpha male, there's a little shared decision-making process they go through. If you want to see how they prove that, I recommend the paper to you. And I'll stop there um, and point out that um, Dan is going to give you the instructions for the breakout. In the American Cancer Society decision aid, uh, a couple of points I'd make is that it's, it's non-quantitative. It doesn't um, communicate risks of prostate cancer incidence or mortality. And as you use it, I'd, I'd ask you to think a little bit about if you were going to be quantitative about some risks, which ones would you cite? There are two parts to it. There is uh, the first uh, eight or nine pages or so that focus on ba the basic knowledge transfer, and then you get into the comparison of the pros and cons and the weighting of values, and that's the part I think we'd like you to focus on in your groups, although always you'd want to be sure if a nurse has taken through a patient or they sent one before the visit that you ask if there were questions and make sure you're getting them on the same page in terms of knowledge. Dan. Sounds great. Can we go back to the previous slide deck and just put the patient description? Oh, yeah. It's like that last slide just to have that up. All right. So we're going to try something a little crazy. Uh, this is not technically a hands-on course, 
uh, but we're going to try a little hands-on shared decision making. So uh, uh, we'll come out into the audience to try to help, but we'd like you all to break up into groups of four. One person will be the patient, doesn't have to be a man, uh, can be anyone. One person will be a physician, one person will be the spouse, and one person will be the observer. The observer won't talk, will just observe, and then report back to the group afterwards. We'll, we'll have a discussion. Uh, and the, the, uh, the other three will, will serve their roles. Uh, we'll be going off of this. I should have blocked the door before I started this. Uh, um, but, uh, but I think this will be a good exercise. It won't, it would promise not to embarrass anyone, but this, this will really generate, uh, uh, some good discussion. And I think give everyone sort of a feel of what it's like to use, uh, to use these things. So I'm going to, uh, I, if you guys have sort of a natural group of four that you want to sort of coalesce around, that'd be great and sort of move around. Otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll swing by and promise to be super, super nice. The idea is not to not to bust anyone. Uh, and if you can, let's make sure that every group has at least some uh, of, these, uh, of these decision aids. Oh, sure. Okay.
All right, everyone, just another minute or two, and then, and then we'll debrief in, in the group. All right, everyone. So, hopefully, everyone's had a chance to to uh, hopefully everyone's had a chance to really discuss this this question. And hopefully, there's been some sort of and, and why don't you guys stay why don't you stay in your groups just for a minute? Um, hopefully, everyone's had a chance to discuss it and come to some sort of uh, uh, decision within their group between the the, the patient and the and the physician. Uh, and now I was hoping we could go around and have the observers report what, uh, what, what they found. Um, are there any observers from any groups who want to go first? Yeah. <laughs> come on, come on up. Hey guys, uh, let's, uh, l let's, uh, yeah, thank you. So go, go, there's a, there's a mic right there if you want or, or... Oh, okay. How did it go? Uh, it went okay. I, I, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't have time to read this and really fully digest it. Well, when I talk to people, and I try not to talk to them very long because I'm a busy guy, but I want to know, and they ask me, about their PSA because most of my patients live in Sun City, Texas, and they play golf all day with people with prostate cancer. And so they want to know if they need a PSA. Well, what I want to know is, let's, let's look at your health. I don't care how old you are. I want to know how long you're going to live. How long did your father live? Well, he died when he was 68. Well, how about your grandfather? Well, he died when he was 58. And what pr problems do you have? Well, I got a hyperlipidemia and hypertension, and I had a stent put in last year. Well, sir, I don't think you need a PSA. I mean, I'd be happy to do one for you, but you don't need it. And on the other hand, if all his male ancestors are dying in their 90s, and he's 78, by the way, that's me. And my ancestors knock on 100 before they die. I gotta, I'm going to get a PSA this fall. I've got an 85-year-old 80, uh, tennis-playing, vigorous ex-athlete who's got prostate cancer everywhere you can pack it. I'm sure he won't live the rest of this year, but his ancestors died in their 90s. He didn't get screened in his 70s. He's dying. Yeah. So I think it's a matter of what kind of patient are you dealing with? How long is he going to live? Has he got a 10-year life expectancy? And we got to remember we're not here to wring our hands about disease. We're here to fight it. So did this stuff come up in the in the discussion? No, well, not really. It did not come up. How, how did the discussion go? Well, it was a very gentlemanly discussion, and okay. and he pointed out that that he asked him if he would be nervous if he if he um, 
if the diagnosis of prostate cancer were missed, how much would it worry him if he had a disease that was often slow growing? Um, uh, it was a very f fair discussion. I, I just don't think it was aggressive enough. I see. So, would, is it fair? Is it fair to say I'm hearing that uh, that you thought the discussion was a good one? but is not the kinds of discussions that you tend to have with your patients. Correct. Different style. Because I don't want some 350-pound, 82-year-old guy with every metabolic syndrome in the world getting a PSA test done. Sure. But I don't want That's my 78-year-old athlete not getting it. Right. And those are clearly not not good candidates for for PSA screening. How, how about some other groups? Uh, uh, Phil, how was uh, how about your group? What did what did uh, who who is the observer in uh, in this group? I, I was the husband, okay, uh, a, a former resident who has an interest in shared decision making from research. Was the patient? Uh, uh, you were the you were the physician, and you were kept the notes. So. Um, so I, I guess we, um, you know, discussion went well. I, I, I think it was very difficult to, we, 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 we got stuck on, on the issue of explaining to the patient when, 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 we, when, when, when he heard cancer, he, she, um, right? So cancer invokes uh, death, imminent death. And so explaining that, uh, that prostate cancer is very slow growing and, and may not catch up with you. Um, I think that was a that was a that was a difficult part. Um, did did you did, did the group feel that the decision aid helped guide that discussion, or were did you still feel like you were at sea trying to trying to explain that? Anyone? We, we we didn't we didn't fully embrace the decision aid. Uh, okay. Just just we we got caught up on other things, I guess. But fair enough. Was the decision aid helpful or or not at all? No, I think it's helpful. I think it's helpful. We we had a discussion then that that how long how much time this takes, how 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 yes. difficult it is to to have this conversation that that it to elicit patients' values and preferences. Actually, these are not patients, right? These are Healthy, healthy men, right, right? That are at risk for prostate cancer. Um, that you have to ask open-ended questions. Every open-ended questions can take two to three minutes. And uh, anyway, it takes takes yeah. it's, it's hard work and takes a lot of time. Yeah. Please, yeah. Hi, I'm Julia Lane. I'm one of the fellows from Michigan. I think the the um, prompt talking the patients coming in from for hydrocel and then bringing up PSAs um, I, I have found that situation really confusing to patients because then they think why are we talking about this it's not symptomatic what does this have to do with my hydrocel that's why I came in so that I think we had a lot of struggle about you know how would you even make that transition and I uh -huh. think most of us would not even bring up PSA screening in the context of a um, chief complaint of hydrocel so the, the reason that this uh, this happened the way that it did was typically patients are not coming to the urologist's office for the for PSA screening. So this uh, you know if we tweak this to say that the man then asked you about PSA screening, would that uh, uh, it, it, the the idea was to get this discussion happening in a clinical setting that most of the participants would be would be familiar with. So I, I, I understand what you're saying about not pushing PSA screening in that particular context, but that, that was sort of the rationale uh, for, for the, the case being presented as, as it were. So maybe it should be more that the patient started asking about it. Uh, sir. Uh, I came from Chile, where Chile, South America, where prostatic cancer with uh, the 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 can the stomach cancer is is the the main cause of death in, in the men and uh, but even more it's more frequent it's one it, it's like the the United States one every six seven men will have a prostatic cancer so there there's a lot of much more cancer that it will there are 
white uh, sheep, and uh, in between there are wolves. So I, I think that uh, we, in my country, we have to encourage to do PSA because we have to change the 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 first cause of death in a, in in a, in, a, in a man, and uh, and uh, and also to half of the men that we will diagnose, we can do an act of surveillance. So we have to catch the wolf between the 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 the, the chiefs, but we have to do more act of surveillance and try to to decrease the 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 first one cause of death in Chile. Did was was this brought up in the group when you guys discussed it? Uh, in the discussion, did this did this come up? No, just I, I, I became late, so. Oh, okay, all right. I, what? Okay. Do you guys? Does someone want to report? Uh, so, oh yeah. Shall I say? In our group, we it was quite interesting that the personal experience of uh, of someone dying from prostate cancer influenced the discussion quite uh, a lot. So that was quite important. So Th that was in your group. That yes, that was that right. was the discussion. Yeah. So so did uh, and 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 what did the patient then ultimately decide? Um, well, at that point, it hadn't been reached because I don't think really. But the but the the, the consequences of um, uh, having a PSA test and then perhaps the downside risks of that weren't. It wasn't enough time to get into that, really. So yeah. uh, it was really the concept that, you know, why wouldn't you have t a testing for a disease that potentially could kill you or, could, or kill someone important right. to you? So, so you know, I, I, I would say, Angie, I don't know if you want to if you want to weigh in on this. If a patient is is coming to you discussing fear of death for prostate cancer, and that's his primary motivation, I think it would be a, a, a preference concordant decision then to go ahead with with PSA screening. If the patient doesn't give you a chance to even mention the side effects, you'd obviously want to do it. But if really the conversation is completely focused around that, then, then that would probably be a, a very preference concordant decision to go to go ahead with that. Okay. What? Yeah, the, and this is the last one, and then we'll go on to treatment. Yeah, my name is Chris Perry. Uh, our group in the back, we uh, kind of got caught up on the the whole dis uh, potential risks and complications of doing the screening thing, and she was the patient was more worried about the hydrocele being cancer, and then we brought up the prostate screening and doing the PSA, and then started talking about the risks of cancer and false positive PSAs and that kind of stuff. We really never got into the kind of the share, you know, about the values. What do you, you know, what are your, you know, what would you think about doing this? Would you be bothered by not? We did. We didn't even get close to that because we just got jammed up with what we were, you know, it was just only so much time to do so much. Right. Uh, maybe that was a failure of mine in framing the discussion. But we do want to focus on on these particular questions. So uh, so let's actually move on at this point and talk about prostate cancer treatment, uh, which is another uh, uh, preference-sensitive condition. Um, I think you probably just on. before you get started, uh, is there another cancer like this? Uh, probably is there breast. A cancer that you can find in a curable state? Thyroid. Breast, thyroid, colon. Colon's a little different. There's a lot of shared decision making in colon cancer, but it's less about whether to be screened or not, and rather how to go about screening. But there's plenty of, of shared decisions. I mean, you could go to well, that. I'm not talking about shared decision. I mean, is breast cancer observed? Is it what? Oh, is it observed? Is it not? Observed. Thyroid can be if it's papillary, right? That they're not everybody. There's a lot of overtreatment of thyroid cancer. Um, and within DCIS, there is actually a trial right now doing active surveillance for DCIS. You know, stage zero breast cancer. Yeah. I guess if you're if you're BRCA positive, you're being observed unless you actually decide to proceed with removing the breast. Yeah. All right. Well, all right. Let let me let's in the interest of time, let me go through, and I'm going to try to zip through these slides. My apologies, but I want to frame the discussion around uh, around uh, using shared decision making for prostate cancer treatment decisions. 
So uh, my disclosures, uh, consultant for FDA, and I have grant funding uh, to study some of these issues. So here's the clinical case for, for this uh, treatment. It's a little bit easier in terms of getting the patient in the door. There's no hydrocele. This is, uh, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, this is a 63-year-old man with a PSA of 7.2. Pretty unremarkable DRE, smooth rubbery, perhaps uh, perhaps some BPH, uh, and the patient had elected prostate biopsy in the past, uh, and that the pathology from a 12-core systematic biopsy revealed grade group two, which uh, uh, to remind folks is three, four, seven, uh, uh, adenocarcinoma of the prostate in one of 12 cores, just one core on the left, and the patient returns to clinic for counseling. So uh, this case was, was chosen specifically because of the range of treatment options that this patient could be offered reasonably. Uh, again, seriously uh, considered options. So uh, this patient is uh, intermediate risk uh, with a PSA that's, that's uh, um, a PSA that's less than 10, but grade group two or three and clinical stage T1C. And uh, he would fall in the favorable, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, unfavorable, grade group two, Sorry, grade group one uh, uh, with PSA less than 10. So in there, in this favorable intermediate risk, there's, a, there's from the AUA guidelines, treatment guidelines for localized prostate cancer, uh, radical prostatectomy or radiotherapy with androgen deprivation therapy are uh, 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 level A, strong recommendation. Uh, uh, but you could also do radiotherapy without ADT. Um, you can also consider conditional recommendation of active surveillance or cryosurgery. Uh, but again, this is so low volume that perhaps that might be more and so, and so focal uh, that this might be a potential option here. Uh, or, or no evidence but uh, a clinical principle or, or expert opinion. Certainly this is happening in the community. Uh, it may even be happening at my own medical center, uh, focal ablative therapy or HIFU. So how do you counsel this patient who's got basically everything on the menu? Um, so the AUA, uh, uh, in conjunction with ASCO, ASTRO, and SUO, has some guideline statements uh, about this treatment, and they are very, uh, uh, they're they're very uh, um, favorable towards towards using shared decision making in this approach, which which I think is is the right approach. So uh, within the guideline, uh, counseling of patients to select a management strategy for localized prostate cancer should incorporate shared decision making and explicitly consider cancer severity, risk category, patient values and preferences, life expectancy, pre-treatment general function and general urinary symptoms, expected post-treatment functional status, and potential for salvage treatment. Whereas for PSA screening, there is a level B recommendation for this. It's uh, uh, for shared decision making, it's a strong recommendation with evidence level A. So this is how we should be counseling all patients who come in with, uh, uh, who have decisions to make in, in for treatment. Um, also, clinicians should encourage patients to meet with different prostate cancer care specialists uh, to, to promote informed decision making with a little less uh, evidence strength. Uh, and effective shared decision making uh, requires clinicians to inform patients about immediate and long-term morbidity or side effects of proposed treatment or care options. So this is straight from the, from the guidelines. So the reason why this is, uh, this is such an important strategy uh, is that prostate cancer-specific mortality is, is low, irrespective of the treatment, with little difference among treatments. We see, uh, we see prostate cancer-specific survival uh, on the left, and the curves essentially overlap. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and, we see, and this is from, um, um, this is from the, uh, um, uh, from Protect. Thank you very much uh, from Protect, and and we see freedom from disease progression on the right, with with not much separation among the different treatments, um, uh, although the data are maybe not as mature as they can be. And in spite of this little difference b between treatment outcomes, uh, surgery and radiation and active surveillance each have very specific side effect profiles, as we all know. I, I won't linger on this so that we can get quickly to. Uh, to uh, a discussion, <clears throat> but uh, so in this, th that's sort of a setup for a, a, a perfect uh, preference sensitive decision. However, what we find is that sometimes it's not the patients who are driving the decision making. Um, so here's here's a paper that uh, that uh, Dr. Fagerlin was one of the uh, one of the authors on. It was uh, interesting to find that as I was searching through the literature that so much of this literature is uh, is, is her own work. Um, but the patient's treatment decisions are based on the urologist recommendations, not on the patient's personal views. So urologist recommendations influence heavily by medical factors such as age and Gleason score, not patient preferences. 
And sometimes that may be appropriate, but certainly not, not always so. And what also is, is somewhat troubling about this finding is that maybe one of the most important uh, uh, side effects of the treatments uh, is erectile dysfunction. And yet urologists only discussed uh, intercourse in 15% of appointments. So we're not really even, uh, at, at times, we're not even getting into what the, what the heart of the decision is. Um, <clears throat> then uh, it's also been found that specialist visits relate strongly to prostate cancer treatment choices. So in patients who undergo prostatectomy, uh, the consultation with only a urologist is basically the most common, uh, the most common uh, uh, um, situation with uh, patients only rarely going to see a radiation oncologist. Whereas patients who are going or are undergoing radiation will almost never consult only with a radiologist and uh, with a urologist, and that's probably obvious because only the urologist could, only the radiologist can deliver uh, uh, radiation treatment. But seeing uh, seeing a different specialist can alter how a, how a patient uh, perceives what sort of treatment he needs and what he ultimately will, will pursue. And then uh, specialists overwhelmingly recommend the therapy that they themselves deliver. So when, uh, uh, when you look at radiation oncologists uh, and when they're discussing uh, radical prostatectomy versus external beam uh, irradiation, uh, and the question uh, is whether radiation is better, uh, only radiation oncologists will ever say that radiation is better. Uh, both the same uh, is, is heavily favored by radiation oncologists, and prostatectomy is better is favored by, by 93% of urologists will state that, whereas only 20% of, of radiation oncologists. So our training and our biases are, are very strongly expressed during patient visits. It's th this, is not, this is not novel. These are not novel findings. We've known about this for a long time, and I think people can, can sort of uh, maybe relate to this uh, in terms of when, when their patients go get counseled elsewhere, or maybe sometimes when they, when they come to us. So uh, uh, within, uh, with, within uh, the domain or within the realm of PSA, uh, of, of not PSA screening, but of, of prostate cancer treatment, uh, the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, the same website that Dr. Barry had shown before, uh, lists a number of prostate cancer treatment decision aids. Um, we don't endorse, AUA doesn't endorse one in particular. There's a number of them out there. These are all, these are all uh, 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 rigorously validated uh, um, and they're, they're demonstrated to, to be effective decision aids. And one that we're going to go through today or try, try to tinker with is uh, the, spe the specific example is the Making the Choice from the Michigan Cancer Consortium. Um, uh, this, this is a, a rather lengthy decision aid that, that uh, if you guys have, you can start sort of thumbing through or taking a look. But uh, again, just like, the, uh, just like the, the PSA screening one, uh, there's a lot of information provided. There's also values, uh, 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 values clarification exercise with the patient uh, and then a prompt to help the patient uh, make the decision in conjunction with, uh, with the urologist. So, all right, we're actually right back on time. So this is great. So uh, can I... I ask everyone to return to their groups, uh, perhaps switch up the assignments. Um, who doesn't have one of these? It, once you get to the groups, and if someone, if a group does not have the uh, the assignment, please raise your hand, uh, and I can I can distribute uh, I can distribute uh, uh, the thing to them. So in this, let's try to switch up roles so people are doing something different. And this time, perhaps, let's definitely focus on the uh, on the treatment decision as the main important thing. Uh, let's not talk about the hydrocele or uh, or or the previous thing. Let let's focus on this so that we can have some again, so that we can have some experience using a decision aid, so that when you guys go back home, uh, you have some experience with it, and you perhaps can can incorporate it into clinical practice. All right. All right. So if everybody's all wrapped up, then uh, uh, maybe let's do the same format. Does, uh, would anyone from the groups like to report how the discussions went? Anyone? You want? Thank you. Yeah. So I think it is in, um, it's very biased by, by the doctor. Um, this is what you said uh, in a moment, moment ago, that it depends who is uh, and who, who is the professional, who is a doctor, and what, whether he's radiologist or whether he's urologist, or, or um, what he intended to do. 
it's very difficult to put the decision to the patient and to show him all the options uh, equi equivocally. If you think that uh, better is prostatectomy, it's uh, difficult to show uh, it, that maybe radiotherapy is the same good because you know it's, you feel that it's not the same. That doesn't matter how it's really, but you feel that it's not the same. How did that play out in your group? No, this was the play out when the doctor says that better is uh, active surveillance. He was thinking about this. It, so it, it is difficult to put to the patient and to tell uh, maybe prostatectomy will be also good. You have to choose. No, because he is choosing a bit uh, in the beginning. Of course, he can. he's still saying you have to choose. But this bias is still present. Is the difficulty in the discussion then that the physician doesn't have enough uh, um, or can't describe all of the treatments in sufficient detail for the patient? Or is the difficulty that there's a strong physician bias in, in terms of the physician knows what the patient, what, what he or she wants the patient to do? Okay, the knowledge can be passed easily. You can yeah. tell this is this, that is that. But, where, but still, you, but the bias is also passed. So pure knowledge is one thing, but uh, your feelings are the other thing. So the patient, could you please tell me about, I don't know, prostatectomy, could you please tell me? You tell, but the patient, but the patient usually asks you, what would you do, what would, what would you do? And still you, you say that, no, I prefer this. And even when you pass the knowledge, you still um, pass a certain uh, emotions with it. And it is biased. Even the pure knowledge is a bit biased because it's never pure because we are people. Yeah. Did the decision aid help? Pardon? Did the decision aid help? This, the, decision the, the decision aid, the, uh, the, the packet of, uh, uh, of information. Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think it was uh, the decision aid here. No. Okay. All right. Any other groups want to report back? So um, our group is kind of interesting because we ha we are the UN over here. We have US, Turkey, and Chile. So um, it was cool to see how our decision making differed. Um, so we use the decision aid. And the first question on here, is there anyth any, uh, import anything important for me to know about my cancer before deciding what treatment to receive? So actually, before we even moved forward, we were all like, oh, you can get uh, the decipher score and we can learn more about your cancer and figure out what's going on even more and then we can decide how to treat you. Um, and then, you know, after that we kind of realized that, you know, access is an issue with that kind of thing. So um, also an important decision making factor. Um, and then in terms of uh, further treatment, we kind of talked about um, what are the side effects on everything and kind of working through each each per person's, each person kind of weighed in a different approach that they would have taken and we weighed the pros and cons and I think it closely resembled what an ideal discussion would look like. That's great. And and the, how about, so, so again, I'm going to ask uh, probably every group, what, it, there's a lot of choices in decision aids. What did you think of this one? Or did it help, did it help the conversation? I thought it did, yeah. Um, I think it facilitated a good discussion. Any negative aspects to, to using this one or this particular one? I didn't have enough time to read all of it. Yeah, it's long. <laughs> it's definitely it's definitely long. Andrew, you want to you want to comment? No, it's long. It's I mean it's good, but. We designed it, um, and, and what we heard and we did a bunch of focus groups was people said that they really wanted a lot of information, that this was a big decision. Um, so it is not something you do in a clinic visit or in the waiting room 15 minutes before, but Agreed. Um, yeah. the standard of care in a lot of the places we've tested has been you get a, the, the patient gets a diagnosis on the phone, and then they have this week or two between that and the treatment decision making. And so... Um, and this is given yeah, so in our trial, we did it at biopsy. Yeah. 
so that, you know, a lot of people didn't need it, but even the guys who had a negative biopsy said, we had a number of people say it was really helpful in the sense that it made me have hope and said that if I got cancer, I wasn't going to be, it wasn't, I wasn't going to die from it. And so even in that waiting period to hear the results of the biopsy, it was comforting to know that there were treatments and the survival rate was really high and um, that way. Yeah, I definitely, ideally would have taken this home and read it and come back here. But. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Other groups. It's a tough exercise when you have four urologists because we just had difficult patients all around. So, <laughs> uh, and I applaud you for uh, your talk because it reaffirms everything that I've been doing in my office is correct. Mm -hmm. I have my own aid that I've been using, and I know time is of essence. But I always do these cancer conferences at the end of the day, so that I'm not forced to run behind and schedule, and I can take the extra time, and I can turn the lights off and lock the doors after my staff leaves. So for me, it takes about an hour. So with that, I want to share an anecdote. Uh, I was at the International Cancer Society probably about 10, 15 years ago, and we had a panel of experts, and I can't name all the experts, but they were all over the world. And the, and the expert said, I have an 80-year-old patient who comes in with a PSA of 7.2, okay, and has a and he wants to have a biopsy. Okay, and he'd ask the audience, what would you do? Nobody would biopsy an 80-year-old guy, right? But he insisted. So he went ahead and he had a biopsy and he came back with a Gleason score of 7 and he had, I think, three or four cores were positive. What would you do? Most people in the audience said, nothing. The patient says, I want my prostate out. Okay, well, we could do radiation. Nope, I want prostate out. Oh, by the way, He's an internationally known individual who is still sexually active. So the patient's driving the, driving the decision making and went ahead and, and they went ahead and took his prostate out, despite everybody else in the audience saying, you're crazy, your reputation's shot. You know, how are you going to ever stand in front of a panel here and, and you know, give us information like this? Guy lived till he was 100 and died from, died from something else. You know who it was? Bob Hope. <laughs> That's a, a great anecdote. My, my mentor, Patrick Wall, should say that he would operate on an 80-year-old, but only if he came to clinic with his parents. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Did anybody else, I, you know, we, I heard as I was walking around some really great discussions. I would love to hear what, you know, what was the most challenging part of this, though? I'd like to just add one thing. Uh, I'm, I'm semi-retired, so I don't have to do this anymore. But when I did, when I was doing a lot of radical prostatectomies, or I was the, I was the guy who referred the patient to the radiation oncologist, I started my prostate cancer talks at 4 p.m., and it was not uncommon at all to leave the office at 7 it's not a 30-minute talk. It's not a 15-minute talk. The stuff we're doing here, is, is, it's not, the time's way off because it's, it's at least a full hour, and to spend three hours is not unusual at all. Right, yeah, and, and believe me, we would have loved to have done this a lot longer, but we're limited by times. But you're absolutely right. These aren't quick discussions. If you're really informing and really listening, they do take time. And again, the goal of this exercise is is just that you have the familiarity with using a decision aid that you see that that you have to kind of leaf through it, see what's in there, so that you have at least some experience with with at least one decision aid, so that you can, if later you decide to bring it back to your practice or when you bring it back to your practice, you, you can you, you have some sort of context for doing that. Shouldn't the time be driven by the patient, too? I mean, that's an awful lot to dump on somebody and you know, an hour. I mean, especially if they only remember 30% of what you told them. I mean, you know, shouldn't this be something that's spread out over a couple of sessions? I think it probably depends. So, so Angie's done a, a very exhaustive study. Uh, I mean, how many, you guys recorded 200 conversations? For One study was 200, the other study was 300. And, and in some of the conversations, uh, shared decision-making happened in, in a shorter amount of time, right? That's true. Tr true. Yes. Uh, no, that's not. Saying there was that that's actually a, a very low correlation between time and um, 
the completeness of okay of, right so there there was a it was a small correlation that you know had a p value that was significant but clinically not significant right so there are people who could do a great job of having really meaningful conversations in a relatively right. short amount of time and people who had very long conversations that was very unmeaningful right I, I think that's so i don't think there is a time right like you, you know um but it's, it's making sure that the patient is heard and that the patient has the information that they need to, to make a decision. I'd just like to know, how do you characterize this shared decision-making concept versus a comprehensive informed consent decision? So in, how I would do it is in terms of informed consent, informed consent is just making sure that they can pass the test that they understand that you are a good conveyor of knowledge, that they understand the treatment, what the prostate is, what the, the treatment options are, what the side effects are, and they can get 100% on a test. Shared decision making is one half of that. You want to inform them, make sure that they understand that they can do well on the test. But then it's also hearing about their values and their goals of care. And informed decision, you're just getting them knowledgeable enough to sign a consent form within shared decision making and the way that it's mostly been defined in the literature is this idea that their values and their goals of care is as important as the, the, the medical facts in the decision-making process. Agree. L last you comment. Have a question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I think this is really helpful. I, I think one piece that is helpful is that it provides some numbers around what to expect because it's not just because people are well, one thing that is complex, people may not are not going to trade things off one to one, right? So, so not one death at 10 years is not the same as one loss of erectile function. So, so you need need a little bit of numbers. Um, I think things that this probably lends itself. I don't know. Is there an electronic version of this? This really lends itself to to going through like John Barry showed that, or or you showed that that it's easier if. Uh, if, if, if the choices are narrowed down, right? So, so as the patient goes through the process, you can take out options and that'll make it easier. Um, so there's two answers to that question. The one answer is, just in case people care, the, there is a nice PDF, colored PDF on, the, on okay. Michigan Cancer Consortiums or it's prostatecancerdecision.org. Um, I have a version, a computer, uh, uh, it's ugly as sin, but it's, it, there's a version of this and that does these values clarification exercise that the NRU VA helped pay for in developing it um, for grant funding. Um, we did not get said grant funding um, and so it just kind of lives in the, yeah. it lives nowhere. Maybe one last thing, that, that, that when you look at the op options, so we have this same, so I, I do a lot of guideline development and there the panel basically does these trades off on behalf of the, you know, in lieu of the patient. And one challenge you have is, is what is, what is loose bowels, diarrhea? So if you have a, you know, that can be severe, it can be mild. So if you have like a, a vignette, we create vignettes around that. It's easier to think about PE. What does PE mean, right? Is it, do I get do I get transferred in the ICU or ventilator, or do I just get put on 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 on, on heparin? So anyway. So no, I think that's a great point. The other half of the world of research I do is in risk communication, and I am so good at figuring out how to present risk and benefit number. We have failed 87 times to figure out how do you pre present severity in a way that people can understand how severe it can be. And you know, for every patient, it's gonna be different, the level of severity and how me puking every day, how I would feel about that versus you in terms of how much this is, how awful it is for me is gonna differ based on how well we do with puking, right? Or our pain tolerances are all different. So it is this thing that we have struggled with so much to try to figure out that severity issue and how do you communicate that well to the patient. So that's a very good comment. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this has been a, really a terrific session. I, I've, I've had a lot of fun. I've had I, fun. I, I hope and, that counts for something. And you uh, didn't scare <laughs> away uh, Michael Berry. He had a family emergency that happened about five minutes before he presented, and then he left to take an early flight home. So, um, But, yeah, so just in case, you w we're worried about that. <laughs> and and uh, I guess to, to direct, uh, uh, if there's any interest, more interest in finding out more about shared decision-making, AUA has a white paper on this. There's the Proceedings of, uh, of a Quality Improvement Summit on this, also on the AUA website. And AUA is really committed to having uh, its membership 
understand shared decision making and apply it in practice because it is the state of the art for these preference sensitive decisions, which is that sort of uh, uh, that, that's our purview a lot of the time. So uh, thank you for coming and and uh, uh, thank you. It's been great. Thank you, you guys. Thank you for continuing to listen to the AUA University podcast. Our podcast can be subscribed to and found on Apple iTunes and on Google Play. Please email education at auanet.org with any feedback or suggested topics. We look forward to hearing from you.